as last week, we'll pick back up with where we were. Um, basically, we're looking at the book of Acts, um, the Holy Spirit, and all the instances in the book of Acts where that terminology, Holy Spirit, is used specifically. Now, we've talked about before that Holy Spirit is not the only time that we recognize that it's the Holy Spirit. There is the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, there are different terms used that point to and even uh, are other names of the Holy Spirit, but we're limiting it to this. There's almost 50 responses or 50 uh, mentions of Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And so we got about five into it last week as we talked through different questions and answers through that. So we're going to start with Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Beginning in verse 20, I mean 33. Acts chapter 2 verse 33. Let me pray. Lord, help us tonight to discover more about you because we recognize that we can never, <laughs> we can never know it all. And the Lord, your, your goodness, your presence, it's just amazing every time we enter into it. Help us to experience you through the power of your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. I, I'd like to do a current events announcement if I can. You may or may not be aware of it, but I, I was going to get some pictures and throw it up there, but it's not really necessary. Um, but I do want to make you aware, if you're not following the news, um, Target. So I don't need to say anything else. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that was great. <laughs> uh, no, but for those of you that don't know, they um, have endeavored to do some things that you know, I mean, call it woke if you want, but I, I really call it spiritual warfare. Um, they have a new pride line that they put at the front of the store, but the, the problem is that they've now commissioned someone to redesign all of their new clothing who is an open Satanist out of the United Kingdom, has a company. Uh, there are even buttons and T-shirts that says Satan loves pronouns. It is just... It's not just on the edge of controversy. It's very controversial. As a matter of fact, I was reading today that they called a special meeting uh, because they're very concerned that they went too far this time. And as a matter of fact, if you've been there lately, you can go again uh, and you will find, at least as far as I understand it, that the entire section has been taken down and moved to the back corner of the store. And uh, so it's just, it's just troubling. But be not dismayed. And Jesus reminds us that when you see these things, what is our responsibility? To look up, because redemption draweth nigh. Amen. <laughs> Some of us are like, that's my favorite store. Go ahead and come off a dollar, get your Costco membership, go over there. <laughs> anyway, God's in control, amen? amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Notice that this pastor didn't tell you not to shop at Target. Because that's not spiritual direction to me you make that decision pray on it and decide on it amen because one of the things that if you don't you may not remember one of the things we got caught up in with 2020 COVID-19 and so on and so forth is pastors begin to wade in the waters too much in my opinion in the political medical I am not a doctor I'm going to wait and see what happens and come on the other side. I'll make a decision for my body, my family, but I trust you to seek the Lord for decisions on your own. If you come to me and ask you, Pastor, what are you doing? I'll tell you. But one of, this is one of those moments where as a society, we, here's the sad part. 
<laughs> I'm getting off on it. The headlines read, Target calls emergency meeting because they don't want to suffer the same fate as Bud Light. That's, that's the headline. It is. And, 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 and <laughs> unfortunately, it's like, why hasn't that already happened a long time ago? Not the Bud Light, the Target. Okay. Acts 2.33. Even Starbucks stopped doing it. I mean, they, they have completely turned a corner. We love veterans, and we're going we're gonna to back up. Anyway, uh, see, this is why I don't need to be talking about this stuff. I want to talk about Scripture. Acts 2.33, here we go. We're going to go all the way to 2.38. 2.33, it says, Now he is exalted, speaking of Jesus, to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us. Just as you see and hear today. What were they seeing and what were they hearing? They were seeing and hearing the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which was speaking in other tongues and prophesying as they walked out from the upper room. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him, and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and even the Gentiles. All have been called on by the name of the Lord our God. Now, a couple of things I want to recognize right out of the bat, right off, right off the bat, is we have the Father. We're in a series called The Promise of the Father right? A promise of the Father is a way that the Scriptures describes Jesus go to Jerusalem and wait on the promise from my Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the Father who commissions the Son to baptize in the Spirit. Now, here's the thing. This is the part that you and I have a hard time wrapping our head around. Trinity. One. One God, three persons, working in unity together, never in competition of one another, accomplishing this goal. Are you with me? So, we have the Father who commissions the Son, who then in turn baptizes in the Holy Spirit, and that's what John said, one is coming greater than me that will baptize in fire and in the Holy Spirit. And we find this flow chart of sorts. Our temptation as people is to say that if the flow chart goes from one to another to another, then that must be subsidiary or less than the one who gives above. You with me? So, for example, if I give you $20 and I say give him tw those, that $20, I don't have $20, or else I'd make this illustration real. You, hey, here's $20, and then give it to him. It looks, feels like to us that I must be the, the one greater than... And then she greater than. But that's not how it works in the Trinity. We see them working in concert with one another, specific roles, specific uh, tasks and assignments for the good of us, and yet never in competition with one another. You don't ever see Jesus trying to take credit for what the Father gives. You don't see the Spirit saying, wait a second, yeah, you baptize by quote-unquote me but I'm the one doing all the work here you with me so we see this uh, happening through here the second thing I want you to notice in this passage is what Peter says the promises to you uh, I'm sorry Peter replied repent be baptized and then he says uh, baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin what baptism is that 
be baptized by Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. What baptism is that? Water. So first, repent. It's called the believer's baptism or baptism of repentance, talked about by John the Baptist, except now it is the believer's baptism, water baptism in the name of Jesus. With me? Because now Jesus has come to the earth, he's died, he's, ro- he's risen, and now we're baptized in his name. Water baptism, uh, then you're not done yet. Peter lays it out in steps. Repent and you're, of your sins. Turn to God, which repentance is turning, right? It's not, I'm sorry, I'll keep doing it. It's repenting and turning away from your sin. Repent, turn to God, that is salvation. We all agree? That is salvation. That's what the thief did on the cross. Recognized Jesus' lordship. Hey, I'm a sinner. Jesus recognized that and promised him paradise. Be baptized, water baptism. Say this word with me, then, or after me. <laughs> I'm like, we can't, we can't say it with you. We don't know what you're saying. Uh, then we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happens after in sequence. I'm a believer. I've been baptized in water as a public declaration of my faith and baptized now in the Holy Spirit. We learn later that there are times where this sequence is interrupted. In other words, the spirit baptism happens in Acts chapter 19, and they're, oh man, we need to baptize them in water now because it's obvious that they have been accepted, not Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 10, because it's obvious that the Gentiles are now included in the plan of salvation because they got the Holy Ghost. You with me? Which, by the way, why do Pentecostal preachers not use the terminology Holy Ghost anymore? Do you know? I like Holy Ghost. It's King Jamesy, but I like it. You know, there's certain times I'm preaching, and Holy Spirit, as I know, uh, is the translation in much of our Bibles today, but sometimes it just feels like I want to say the power of the Holy Ghost. Right? It's more fun sometimes, but... The reason why is because the ghost connotation speaks more of uh, demonic or spiritual, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, not, not God, so to speak. All right. You with me? Any questions? This is your time to shine. All right. I can do this all night. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Now, we're going to move into a different little section. What we did last week is I would write down, watch this. (laughs) Sorry, I couldn't resist. (laughs) All right, (laughs) what am I doing? Gosh, what did I do? Oh. Okay, now what I'd like to do is the exercise we had last week as we're teaching through different things about the Holy Spirit. Yell out if you if anything strikes you that this is what the Holy Spirit's doing in this in this context. So so for example, prophecy. That's where the Holy Spirit's giving a word of prophecy. So which by the way is not the next one, but maybe maybe that will be later for you. Acts chapter four, verse eight. Peter and John now move and uh, are doing ministry, are, are seeing great miracles. Things are happening. The church is growing. Thousands of people. And then in verse 8 of Acts chapter 4, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, and he goes through how the healing happened. Specifically, verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and then starts this discourse about preaching, teaching, why he was able to heal. Anybody want to take a stab at what the Holy Spirit does right there? Gives him what to say. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Words, 
in his mouth. Jesus told the disciples, don't worry about going in front of rulers and elders because the Holy Spirit in that time will give you the words to say and to give you an argument. Danny, you get a star. How many of you guys remember what happened last week? You you already forgot what happened last week? Danny, Darlene, you guys still engaged? Congratulations. There was an engagement last week. Was it last? It was last week, yeah. (laughs) Amen. Danny, how do you spell your last name? That's just if anybody wants to give a check to the wedding expenses, just give it directly to Danny there. I'm just kidding. Uh, That was good. That's perfect. Acts chapter 4, verse 25. Here we go. Starting in verse 23, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John have gone to prison, and then they were released uh, by the power of the Lord and the favor and all of that. Um, As soon as they were freed, which by the way, when they were released, don't preach in the name of Jesus. This is that passage, this is that passage where he says, "I, I, I have to obey God rather than men, right? As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said when they heard the report all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God O sovereign Lord creator of the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through your ancestor David your servant saying why were the nations so anger angry why do they waste their time on with futile plans the kings of the earth prepare for battle rulers gather together against the, the Lord and against the Messiah They're celebrating because they had victory over the rulers of the earth. The Holy Spirit, I'm going to put, shifted things in their favor. Moved on Peter and John's behalf. If the government would have had their way, they would have killed them for preaching in the name of Jesus. And I love what it says if you back up to verse 16. We can't deny that you performed a miraculous sign. And everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts says the Holy Spirit a lot. Why? Because we need to know that there is no power without him. And that's where we get it wrong so many times. We try to do it on our own power, in our own volition, in our own conviction. We try to preach, teach, share, evangelize, sing, father, be a good mother, be a good father, be a good husband, be a good wife, be a good student, be a good employee. Everything for the believer is attached to the infilling and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And when we know that that is our source, it becomes a little bit more intentional for us to be filled daily with it. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. I think I want to read, um, I'll keep reading in verse 27, and then I'll go to 31. 27 to 31. I tell you, David's sweating back there. (laughs) <laughs> now, now he's got the main menu up there <laughs> David oh there you go <laughs> poor guy he's trying I can give you my notes in advance next time but that wouldn't be as fun for me <laughs> poor guy did you eat supper uh, good okay so you're okay you got calories to burn you're good <laughs> alright that 27 In fact, they're continuing on, this has happened here in this very city for Herod, Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, the people of Israel, were all united against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. Hmm. Somebody needs to write down Acts chapter 4 verse 28. Everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. 
Let it be a reminder to us tonight that God knows. Sometimes we forget God knows. Amen? And because he knows, he'll take care of you. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, I love this passage. After this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God in, with boldness. So I've got a question. Yes, go ahead. I'm wondering, in this passage... <laughs> It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And weren't they already filled with the Holy Spirit? That's a good question. Let's explore that together. Um, anybody else see that? Peter went back to the believers. The believers in this context were the ones that had been with him and had been a part of the day of Pentecost. And, and now, this, listen, I'm going to tell you. The status quo or the assumption is that in the early church, there was no denominational lines. With me? Everybody had the same path of discipleship. What Peter said, repent and turn, trust the Lord, baptize, and then receive the Holy Spirit. So if that is what's happening with these thousands of believers, then we can assume, at least, that everybody here is filled with the Holy Spirit. But then God did it again. Which means every month in the month of May, we, we focus on the Holy Spirit. And uh, this past month, one of the things we've tried to do with intentionality is say, come forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit or... If you just need a fresh touch of the Lord and to be refilled and want to agree with someone on that, then come forward as well. Can I tell you, you can never ask to be filled too much. Because isn't that the point? That you're full and then you overflow. And then in the overflow, God uses you. Because if it's just for you, then it's just full and there, there's a cap. But that's not how the Lord works. God wants you to ooze and to spill out and to be used of him mightily. So we see here these believers were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The place shook. Funny story. The, <laughs> the week, you may have been here, you may have not, but the week I preached on prophecy, I think it was the 11 o'clock service, there was thunder that would hit when I would, you know, it was totally unintentional, but it was so cool because it, it seemed like every time I was saying something really ominous, you know, the thunder would go, oh, I'm like, yeah, it was awesome, you know. It's like the Lord helped me preach because sometimes, you know, you, you hear preachers sometimes, they help me preach, you know. Y'all want me to get excited. You help me preach. Man, the Lord was helping me preach that day. I, was a, that was a lot of fun. But the thunder hit. It shook this building, it shook this place. I was like, wow. I can't even imagine what it was like in kids' church that day. These kids are running under chairs. and you Remember, as a kid, you're scared of thunder. I love thunder now. It's awesome. Verse um, 31, the place shook. You know, I, there's a... There's some debate on what we call manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Some years ago, there was a, a documentary called The Finger of God. And then there was another one after that. Do you remember? It was Finger of God, and there was another one. Weird stuff. Anyway, in this particular documentary, it was things like gold teeth appearing in people's mouths, gold dust coming from ceilings. And different, different signs and wonders, manifestations, and all of that. And, and first of all, you need to know, I'm not here saying none of that happened. I'm not saying that. If it happened, great. God bless them. I'll take a gold tooth. Why not? 
But the problem is, during the 90s, when those things were really happening, people began to shift and seek the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, forgetting altogether that it was the Holy Spirit they needed to be seeking after. And, and in, in Pentecostal circles, you know, there's this sentiment that, yeah, I went to this church, and at this church, the Holy Spirit moved, and it was an amazing thing, and the preacher never even got up there. Well, I don't know which church you go to, but here at Greater Life, I don't see that as a win. I like to preach. <laughs> and so I go home like, man, I had a great message today. You know, I didn't even get to tell anybody about it. So I'm preaching to Kelly and the, and the, and the wiener dogs at the house in the afternoon. I got to tell somebody about this. But, but I think it's important that we read this and we, we are tempted. Lord, shake this place by your presence. Can I tell you, God's more creative than that. He don't need to shake because it shook then. There's something new on the horizon because that's the God that we serve. Could he shake this place right now? Of course, of course. But what about the lasting power of seeking the infilling of the Holy Spirit and being able to walk in that authority and that power in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces? Because it, what, what God wants us to do is not to go to the place to experience a manifestation, but to go out and manifest the power of God in our community. Amen? And so when we run to where these things are happening, sometimes we're seeking what we would consider, I'm mean, even a fad is a terrible way to say it, but, but I believe that God's got a unique manifestation, if I can use that word, or unique move for us that will be flowing out from these walls to infinity and beyond. I had to, I'm sorry. And I know Disney's woke, but anyway, here we go. <laughs> Someone was talking to me one day, and I won't tell you who his, what his name is, it's Brett. And uh, he was talking to me, and uh, we were just talking about end times or something. And finally he stopped me, he said, wait a minute, are you joking right now, or are you serious right now? Because you shift back and forth too fast for me sometimes. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sorry. It is what it is. All right. Acts chapter 5. Hmm. Yeah, we got to do it. It's in there. Ananias and Sapphira got together to conspire a plot to cheat the church and get ahead. They knew God's word but did not fear it, tried to cheat the Holy Spirit. Peter prophesied it and they both dropped dead. You ever heard that one? That's back in the day kids church right there. Can you believe we were singing that in kids' church? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I said Sapphira got together. <laughs> Poor little six-year-olds. Man, we missed it a couple times back in the day. All right. Acts <laughs> chapter 5, verse 3. Uh, starting in verse 1, there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property he brought... He, bought, um, he brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was a full amount with his wife's consent. So he and his wife knew what they were doing. He kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. You kept some of the money for yourself. The property was not yours to sell. Was, was the property not yours to sell or not, as you wished? After, and after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do this thing, do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died, and everyone who heard it was terrified. Now, here's the thing. We find the Holy Spirit giving Peter the knowledge to recognize this deceit. Now, the problem is not that Ananias kept the money for himself. What was happening in those days, if you go back to Acts 2.42, and then uh, even in Acts uh, chapter 1, I believe, at the end, the believers had all things in common. So what they would do is they would sell their property and bring all of the proceeds to the church, and whoever had a need, they would take it home. The problem was 
he was presenting as if he was giving it all, and yet he wasn't. So it really wasn't about what he was giving. It was about the way he was presenting it and the, and the deceit that was in there. And we see the Holy Spirit giving Peter this knowledge. Acts 5, 32. We are witnesses. Peter, uh, verse 29, to give us some context. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than any human authority and that God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of the honor of the right hand of the prince and savior. As prince and savior, he did this so the people of Israel would repent, the sins forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. Okay, we have a qualifier that just appeared. The Holy Spirit is given by God to those who obey Him. That's a pretty clear qualifier, is it not? I heard a message one time preached called Power Thieves. The, the message premise is the idea that when you receive the Holy Spirit, the power of God comes upon you, the power of the Holy Spirit, and you can operate in that anointing. Here's the deal. There are things that you can do in your life that will steal your power. We know, as Jesus was teaching about worship, that if you hold something against your brother, you need to go and make it right before you come and bring your sacrifice or worship right? Same thing, I believe, applies here, that when we find ourselves living in disobedience or in rebellion to the Lord, how can we then expect to be used in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you with me? Which gives us this contextual question. How can you be, quote unquote, gay and Christian? Open disobedience, and yet trying to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. The two cannot live together in peace and in harmony. It's not God's design. So we have to be changed to live for the Lord in obedience and then walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me add this. Don't ever think for a minute that as long as you obey, let's just take, for example, that, that one year goes by and you look back and say, man, I have for one year been completely perfect. I haven't done anything for one year. I can mark it every day. I go into my prayer closet and I write down and I haven't done that and I haven't done that and I, I'm good here and I'm good here and I'm even the most humble person that I've ever met. And, and as you make this list, <laughs> and as you make this list, you self-determine that, man, you are sin-free Therefore, your power must be way up there. That's not a correct assessment of the Scripture either. It goes like this. The power that you walk in comes from God. It is by the Holy Spirit. But you cannot live in rebellion, whether it's open or hidden, and expect to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't. Does that happen? Yes. Because it's God's promise that his word will not return void. But at some point, as the proverb says, you cannot play with fire. <laughs> it will fall into your lap and you will get burned. Right? So, I, want, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Now, we see in um, Acts chapter 6, Verse 5, just a recognition of Stephen, who is a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 7, 51. Question of you, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? I'm just going to blow through a few of these, Dave, and then I'll tell you when I'm going to hang out on one for a while. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Here, the Holy Spirit did something. 
full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven. What is happening right here? What is the Holy Spirit doing for Stephen? Vision. He's seeing something in the spirit realm because he's full of the Holy Spirit, and he's experiencing that. Acts chapter 8, we see this story of Philip. And I, let's explore this for a minute. This is a fun one. Acts chapter 8. This is very Star Wars or Star Trek-like. Can I just tell you? Somebody's hair is on the brace. That's not what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Can I just tell you that God is the most creative? All these little ideas that Hollywood gets, follow it all the way back. Because who thought that a person could be transported through beams somehow from one place to another? Well, God did. <laughs> it happened to Jesus in his glorified body as he appeared in one place and then disappeared and went in another. Then it happened to Philip, it happened to Paul, as Paul talks about being caught up to the third heaven. But it happened to Philip, and I like Philip's the best. The language described for Philip and for Paul are that word, is that word that we love here at Greater Life Church, rapture. So Philip got raptured before the rapture raptured everybody else it's theologically correct if you write it down you'll see it Philip verse chapter 8 verse 26 as for Philip an angel of the Lord said to him go south down to the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza so he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia a eunuch uh, of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Let me start by saying this. How was the Ethiopian eunuch going to Jerusalem to worship? We've talked about this before on Wednesday night. How did the Jewish faith make it to Ethiopia? Huh? Who said it? Solomon, the queen of Sheba visited Solomon and took back the Jewish faith to Ethiopia, which is really cool because now we find in Ethiopia evidence of Jewish Ethiopians who served the God of the Bible all the way back thousands of years. Then Christians in the first few years or really few months of the early church, Ethiopia shows up again. I think it's cool. The Ethiopian eunuch is there, and uh, reading the scriptures, the eunuch had gone down to Jerusalem to worship, verse 28, and now he was returning, returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over. So the Holy Spirit's doing something. Leading. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over there. Walk along beside the carriage. Philip said, I don't want to, that's weird. Isn't that what we say? <laughs> Talk to them about me. I don't know. That's weird. I don't know them. Philip ran over. Can I, can I tell you, church, there's a lesson to be learned here. The Holy Spirit says, go over and walk along beside the carriage. So what did Philip do? He ran. He didn't just walk. He ran. Can we get some enthusiasm for serving the Lord again and in in some, some pep in our step? Amen? Like, man, God, if you assign me to do something. Now, this is where I get in trouble. I like to move fast. And I literally, I haven't even got due diligence on this property next door, but I met with the architect today. I got the plan. I'm ready. You know, I'm, I'm over there in the woods measuring with a tape measure. Yeah, that fit good right there. It looks good. What do you think? Yeah, you got a water line right here. That'd be good. We knock that down. We move that over here. Anyway, I got to ask the town of Mint Hill first. Submit to the authorities. <laughs> Trying to build it and say, what are you doing? Nothing? 
<laughs> Mint Hill's great. They'll say yes. Amen. All right, what am I doing? He ran. Okay. He ran over there. The man replied, how can... Uh, Philip ran over there and heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep before the slaughter, a lamb silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, went down and baptized him in water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched, raptured Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself. <laughs> love the way it says that. Oh. <sighs> okay. I found myself, <laughs> found myself at a town of Azotus. He preached the good news there in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. I don't know about you, but it would take me a little bit longer to get acclimated. But he found himself, hey, have you heard about Jesus? <laughs> you picture it, <laughs> Philip, this guy. Um, what I want you to see here is something that's missing. What's missing from the encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch? Think of the three things that Peter told the people to do. It's missing. So he believed through the preaching and explanation. He was baptized in water, and then the Spirit, same Holy Spirit that we are to be baptized in, the Spirit took him away. That's interesting to me. And it's interesting because what we're doing is we're preaching and teaching about how it's important for the believer to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and it's for every believer, and that in this context, we find the eunuch doesn't get to experience it, or at least we don't read about it. But what we do read about is he goes away rejoicing. We do know that the Ethiopian church knows and has their own translation of the Bible, which is full of the Holy Spirit moving. We know that the church in Ethiopia was vibrant and thriving and still is today for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we know at some point the Holy Spirit became evident in the Ethiopian church, which, by the way, I uh, was watching a video today that there is evidence of letters written in China during the dynasties that was reigning in A.D. 31 about Jesus. It references the eclipse. And even though it is, it's the most interesting thing because it doesn't, it doesn't go into the religious... Um, connotations and prophecies and all that it, it says in multiple different letters there's one that says it this way and it's variations of this there was an eclipse where the sun and the moon were switched and a man took the sins of everyone upon him so it's almost like these scholars and astronomers are writing this out I can't even imagine it, it's, it's literally on paper it's on record they're writing this out. Well, why would, I write, why would I write that? It has nothing to do with recording the signs of the sky. Oh, well, just keep writing. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch takes this gospel back, and we immediately see an ember that was planted in the eunuch's life that goes and a whole church is now in Africa. Which did you know that the Garden of Eden, most people believe now that the Garden of Eden is in Africa or was. And even the promised land was more in Africa than it was in the Middle East. You know, the, all of that is mushed together right there, right? 
and the lush plains of what used to be there, the demographics and the, and the, and the geography and everything has shifted some, but many, t- many people do believe that the promised land, Garden of Eden, is in the plains of Africa. So contrary to what you believe, it's not the sunken city of Atlantis, which might be real. We won't get into that. All right, where am I at? I got time for one more cool story. Acts chapter 28. I've talked about it before. How the book of Acts is written, not with a period, but with a comma, in a sense of the way that it's written is open-ended. As if things continue to happen. Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 25. Beginning in verse 24. Beginning in verse 23. <laughs> uh, that'll be it, 23. <laughs> Beginning in verse 23. <laughs> so Paul is under Roman guard here. It's toward the ends of his ministry. So a time was set on that day. A large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them uh, from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. It's always the case. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with the final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, Go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For their hearts, for the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear. They have closed their eyes. Their eyes cannot see. Their ears cannot hear. Their hearts cannot understand. and They cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Speaking of the Jewish nation. Verse 28. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the Lord about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the best statement of all, and no one tried to stop him. <clears throat> Paul had been beaten. He had been prisoned. He had been threatened with death. He had been ridiculed. He had been lied on. I mean, everything had happened to Paul. Shipwrecked. And no one, the end of his story, and no one tried to stop him. Love that. See, here's Paul's trajectory. All of these things happened, and in the end of his life, he literally stood before kings. So, let's take this last thought away with us tonight. The Holy Spirit in Paul's life, he got knocked down on the road to Damascus. He got blinded. We believe that the thorn in the flesh that he talks about was something that had to do with his eyes, that they never got made right completely, that there was pain there or suffering, we believe. Then, as he's waiting upset, praying, thinking. Ananias, a man comes and prays for him. The scales fall off his eyes. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and begins his ministry. He begins his ministry, but it's not until 13 years later that he quote-unquote gets credential. Right? 13 years later, the church recognizes his ministry and blesses his ministry and appoints him to go and do ministry. But notice for 13 years he was doing ministry way before his credential. You with me? Then he goes into this official ministry and begins to experience even greater persecution. But through all this, he's arrested. And no one wants to do anything with him. 
Well, let me ask this ruler over, this governor over here. Let me ask Caesar over there. How about King Agrippa over there? So every time, picture it, every time they need help with Paul, they march him into the, to the government house or into the throne room, whatever it was established, and they say, Paul, they want to talk to you about what you did. And the ruler says, tell me what's up. Paul <laughs> presents the gospel like three times in front of rulers. And we know that later, as we read in his letters, that there were people in Caesar's household that were funding the ministry. Why? How? Because Paul presented the gospel to these officials, and the people serving these government officials were getting saved. <laughs> we thought, in the narrative, he's there to save the king. He's there to save Caesar. He's there to save, the, save Pilate. But we forget that the people standing on the sidelines are now giving their lives to Jesus and getting filled by the Holy Spirit and funding the gospel. Now, at the end of his life, he's brought before the king. And the Bible tells us that they set this up in a large auditorium. They bring everybody in. Paul, tell us what the problem is. He preaches again to many, many, many people. And then at the end of his life, he's in his home, living under guard, and no one tried to stop him. I think the encouragement for us is, no matter your season, be faithful in it. No matter your season, please be faithful in it. Because at the end of the day, you want this kind of scripture to be the end of your life that you were still talking about Jesus when the Lord finished your ministry. Amen? Any questions? Lots of great questions tonight, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> I came into it, man, there were awesome questions last week. I'm just going to do questions and answers. This is going to be great. Well, let's just look at each other for one more minute because that's what we got. Anything else? God bless you. It's going to be an awesome week. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we've had to hang out tonight and just uh, learn more about you. Thank you, God, for what you've done for so many, for so many years, and the stories that we have in the scriptures to encourage us. <laughs> I pray that you would help us lean in to be ready to see what you're going to do next. Greater things are yet to come. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.